second half, physical fitness. Who gets the most exercise around your house? You or your dog? Many of us are more concerned about our pet's need for proper diet and exercise than we are about our own. But there is one thing about it. If you're the one who walks the pet, at least you're benefiting from the exercise too. This is Jack Shelley from Iowa State University asking you to take a serious look at the shape you're in now that you're starting the second half of your life. Where are the bulges beginning to show? Studies show that nearly 50% of the women in our country are overweight, much to their dismay. And we men needn't start chuckling either. More than 30% of us are overweight too. All that has to do with overeating, you say? Well, to some extent, yes. But many of us lead a very sedentary life. Not that we don't work, we work hard. But perhaps with very little physical movement. We sit all day on many jobs, or we stand in one spot to do our work, and even much of our recreation takes on that sedentary air. Well, so what? We deserve the good life. And none of us wants to return to that back-breaking labor our grandparents went through. But muscles do weaken if they're unused, and one of the muscles we depend on the most is the heart. Topping the causes of death of those of us past the age of 45 are heart diseases. And also, the older we get, the more our death rate shows diseases affecting the lungs. That's why keeping both our heart and lungs in top physical condition is so important at any age. Here's what authorities in physical education are saying. Well, you know that about 55% of all of the deaths in the United States are associated with cardiovascular diseases. And uh, they're talking about diseases of the heart and the blood vessels. And um, because people do not exercise regularly and eat too many fatty foods and so on, the blood vessels tend to uh, become very narrow and they are not very elastic and blood flow through them is limited. Um, this, of course, uh, can uh, put a great strain on the heart when it has to pump its blood through these, these small, uh, narrow arteries. For the past two years, we've been taking blood samples and measuring triglycerides and cholesterol blood serum levels. We have shown with both men and women through a 10-week exercise program of three nights a week for one hour uh, will decrease the blood serum cholesterol levels and also the triglyceride levels. The harder you work, the more success you're going to realize. You train and condition the cardiovascular system. We're talking about the heart, and the lungs and the circulatory system. Now, it's also important that you continue this. If you do not continue it, then after a period of time, then your blood serum cholesterol levels and triglyceride levels will go right back to where they were before you began exercising. So, exercise is important. And when we're young, competitive sports and school programs build in much of the exercise we need. But once we get into the second half of our life, we have to make a concentrated effort ourselves to get exercise into our busy schedules. So what kind of exercise gives us the cardiovascular workout they speak of? The sit-ups and the push-ups don't, okay? Golf doesn't. But the activities which do are things like cycling and swimming and jogging and fast walking and stair climbing, things that you do the same movement over and over for at least five minutes. Riding a bicycle, jumping the rope, running in place, anything that will cause your heart to increase the, uh, the rate of, uh, of contraction. So if you can increase the heart rate, uh, then you are training the cardiovascular system. If you have a 10 speed, um, what you do is adjust the amount of resistance that you have to apply to the pedals to go at a given speed by changing gears. So again, the main criteria is what is my heart rate for the distance and the speed that I'm going. If we're singling out one, I would say that jogging is probably one of the, the best uh, uh, single exercises uh, 
because you're still exercising a number of the muscle groups, you're also training the cardiovascular system. And again, speed is not important. Jogging is a slow-paced run. And the main thing I think that, that you have to keep in mind is that you're never competing against somebody else. Joe Schmo down the street may be able to run a six-minute mile or an eight-minute mile. So what? That's good for Joe Schmo, but for you, who can barely, you know, walk a 15-minute mile, um, that's not what you should be trying for. After you've been exercising for, let's say, five continuous minutes um, or at the end of 10 or whatever it is that you're doing, you should take your pulse so that you get the number of times that your heart was beating per minute. And the, the rate at which the heart is beating is an indication of how much stress you're placing on your body and your heart. The person who is 40 years old um, will not have as high a maximum heart rate as a person who's 20 years old. In other words, the maximum speed with which your heart can beat is going to decline as you get older, regardless of how fit you are. So when you're training or exercising and you're 40 years old, you're going to want to work in the 120 to 140, maybe 150 beats per minute category, depending upon how much preconditioning you've done and, and how healthy you are to begin with. Um, if you were in the 60-year-old category or toward the 60-year-old category, you definitely would, would want to stay uh, maybe 10 beats below that. So you want to work within a range that's acceptable for you, depending upon your age. But the thing that you'd want to do is to exercise within limits and not get your heart up above the limits that's been set by the, uh, by the medical doctor. Now, uh, there's other activities that you can participate in. You can swim. Uh, now, you don't want to go out and try to keep up with a 20-year-old, but you swim at your own pace and you build up your own physical fitness level and your own endurance and you'll see great improvement but you'll also see plateaus where you have to work very hard to increase what you're actually doing but you can do this and there's no reason for anyone of any age saying that I'm too old to go out and exercise who is too old here's a man who just retired at age 70 Yet his son says he can skate circles around many of the younger folks who gather at the ice rink. Well, my dad grew up in Ohio and he first began skating on a canal that ran through the farm and I think he skated to school. He taught me to skate when I was about five years old and I've been skating ever since and he has too. And I, <laughs> that's how I know pretty much how he skates. Now he skates all the time in the winter when he has the opportunity to and when he doesn't have the opportunity to, he wishes he could, so. And another example, a national tennis champion of the past 65 age group. He beats many younger men at this sport, too. How much physical effort does it take to do that? Well, I play the year round, actually. During uh, the winter, I will probably play four and five times a week. In the summertime, I probably play more than that. Uh, it will probably be five or six times a week. Don't do any other exercises. It's, uh, I simply play a lot of tennis. Sometimes, uh, but very rarely, I've, I've jogged a little bit. But uh, that's only when I can't play tennis. But I play quite a bit of it. We asked this tennis enthusiast if he'd recommend starting this strenuous game after age 40. Well, when I started again in uh, 47, I was 39 years of age at that time. And... Uh, I think even at that age and coming back again, I think one has to be a little careful so that you play moderately to begin with until you get in the good physical condition. Once you get there, then you must play consistently. And that's the reason why I play uh, four and five times a week. And uh, one of the good reasons, uh, aside from enjoying the game, is to uh, keep in good physical condition. Well, we've seen a number of good ways to get cardiovascular exercise into our lives, especially into the second half of our lives. But just how do you go about starting? Just get on the bicycle and pedal to beat the band? If you've been a, a sedentary individual for a number of years, and you are over 40, then the first thing you should do is to get a physical examination and get a clearance from a medical doctor to start a program. You have to start 
where you are right now. And most people must start with a walking program. And when they can walk a mile or two miles, and they increase the, the pace of that walk, and so they can do a couple of miles at a fairly r brisk walk. Then um, they can start in with a slow, very slow jogging program. I've seen a lot of success where, where partners uh, work together, a man and his wife, uh, and they, they help each other. And I think this is important. Uh, if you have a neighbor or someone uh, that you can exercise with, this makes bicycling, exercising, look like fun after 40. But does that mean that we can toss out the old calisthenic exercises then? Certainly not. That's the other half of, uh, of a good exercise or good fitness program. Uh, the cardiorespiratory endurance activities are one half. Um, they take care of what you can't see. And then there are the, the calisthenics or the uh, sit-ups, push-ups, and so on that you do for all the muscles. Uh, and the appearance of the body that you can see. And what can you see? We'll have to admit, more of us are concerned about our shapes than we are about the shape our heart and lungs are in. Let's face it, that body of ours is changing all the time. And the change happens so slowly we hardly know it's going on. For instance, we're growing shorter, perhaps as much as an inch by the time we reach age 70. And our framework may change a bit during that shortening. It all depends on how much we let our posture slump. Many times the head comes forward, or the shoulders tend to droop. For women, the bust line lowers. And for both men and women, it gets increasingly hard to hold that tummy in. And on women especially, the hips and the thighs tend to get bigger. For those who do little physical work or little exercise, those figure changes usually come about pretty fast during the second half of our lives. But for those who stay active, body changes, body changes are usually slowed down then. Yes, with regular exercise, we can really keep ourselves in better shape and for a longer period of time too. Now physical educators say that we can tone up our muscles by choosing the right exercise for each part of our body. Yes, if you um, are going to work on your arms and shoulders, you're going to do arm swinging, uh, uh, push-ups uh, for the back of the arm, the tricep area, and you're going to do pull-ups for the front of the arm. Then if you're going to work on the abdomen, then you're going to have to do the sit-ups and modifications of the sit-ups and single leg lifts and things like this. Then you have to work on the back muscles and do a few exercises for the back muscles. Finally, you get down to the hips and, and the thighs, and you need to work on exercises to keep those muscles firm. So there is a way to program our exercise pattern to include all these body muscles. Dr. Barbara Forker, head of the physical education department at Iowa State University, shows eight simple exercises that will do that job. The first exercise, arm circling. Make big circles with the arms, reaching out as far as you can, first forward, then backwards. Make smooth, fairly rapid circles as you go around. Do about 10 to 20 of these for a good muscle toning. This is mostly for arm and shoulder muscles, but also it's good for the back and chest as well. The second exercise, trunk twisting. Bring your arms up to shoulder height, elbows bent, and then turn as far as you can from side to side. You should feel some pull in your rib cage and in your upper back. Be sure to take a wide stance too with your feet. This kind of helps you keep your balance. Another thing, keep looking straight ahead and don't let your head turn with your body. This keeps you from getting dizzy. About 10 to 15 of these twists to each side will do a lot to stretch and help strengthen your upper trunk. Third exercise, the windmill. This again takes a wide stance. And raise your arms outward, cross over and touch one toe, back up, cross over and touch the other toe, back up, and so on. Just be sure to keep those knees straight. Don't let them bend. If you do, you're not gonna get full benefit from this exercise. 
and always come back up to that standing position after you touch a toe. There's no need to hurry through this exercise, but do stretch and get the most out of it that you possibly can, even if you can't reach your toes. Do about 10 to 15 of these to each side. The purpose, of course, is to stretch the muscles in the back of the leg. Now we come to exercise number four, the sitting toe touch. Down to the floor for this one to a sitting position. Legs wide spread. Then reach with both hands first to one toe and then to the other. And again, don't bend that knee as you reach. And don't be discouraged either if you can't reach your toes at first. Many people can't but just keep stretching gently and you'll come closer as you do it regularly. This exercise stretches the lower back muscles and the backs of the legs. And oh yes, reach forward too for a little different stretch. Exercise number five takes some sort of support like a counter or a sturdy table perhaps. This one is leg swings. You swing your leg forward to a comfortable height and then backward. Up to speed, this is what it looks like. Now be sure to keep that leg straight, no bent knee, and tighten those muscles as you swing. Turn and face the opposite direction and hang onto the counter with your other hand and swing the opposite leg. This firms up leg muscles, hips, and the buttocks too. You do about five to ten of these with each leg. Now add a side swing, swinging that leg straight up from the body and back. When you're doing leg swings, by the way, keep your head up and be sure your back is straight. Don't let your body bend forward, backward, or sideward. Now exercise number six is sit-ups. That's for keeping the abdomen strong and firm. You start flat on your back with your knees bent. This makes your abdominal muscles do the work. Have someone hold your feet down or tuck your toes under the damp board or a heavy chair. Now curl yourself up to a sitting position. yourself curl back down. If you find this difficult to do, grab a hold of your upper legs and help pull yourself up. Or you might try using a sharp rope like a jump rope. Put that around your knees and pull yourself up this way. Eventually you'll be able to sit up with just the added lift that you get when you start with your arms above your head. The hardest type lift to do is where you clasp your hands behind your neck. This is for the advanced exercisers only. So start with a sit-up that you can do easily, then stick to it until you can do about 20 to 25 right in a row. Now roll over on your stomach for exercise number seven. This is the arm and leg lift. This one helps you strengthen your back. With your arms over your head, lift your head, arms, and legs all at the same time. Hold it and then relax back to the floor. Now this isn't easy to do, so if you want to start with just lifting your legs only, one at a time. Then you can put the whole exercise back together again and lift arms, legs, and head. Lift and relax. Lift and relax. About five of those should be enough. Exercise number eight, push-ups. This strengthens the arm and shoulder muscles. The old-fashioned army style push-ups with just toes and hands on the floor is a good one. But this one is the hardest one to do. 
So try the easier one from a bent knee position. Instead of keeping your body straight from head to toe, as you did in the army style, you keep it straight from head to knee, to bent knee. Don't bend at the waist or at the hip. Or even an easier form of a push-up is the one where you merely push away from the wall with your hands flat against the wall and your feet back about two feet. You keep the body in a straight line as you bend your arms and touch your nose to the wall. Then push back until your arms are fully extended about 20 to 25 times all together. And remember, no bending at the waist or hip to reach the wall with your nose. So there are just eight exercises, simple enough for any of us to do. In case you didn't jot them down, remember they're available. They're available in your booklet of things to do in the second half of your life. You may receive a copy free by dropping a card to this station. And who knows? After starting on a regular physical fitness program of cardiovascular exercises like walking or jogging, plus these eight calisthenic type exercises, you may just find a new you, figure-wise, which turns our attention now to wardrobe concerns. Regardless of figure changes, clothes always look better and they feel more comfortable if they fit right. Yes, and to feel comfortable, a garment needs to fit fairly loose around the hips. But for the past 40 woman especially, who tends to gain weight in the hip and thigh area, if a garment fits there, then it's usually often large at the top. And it might well be, too, if you've lost a few inches with a good exercise program. But remodeling's not a difficult task, especially in women's clothes. And if there are already darts in the waist, just take those in just a little bit deeper. Watch to see that you don't pull the side seam out of alignment, and then pin it in in the front darts, too. Sit-in sleeves that hang down over the arm are just not comfortable, so pull those back up on the tip of the shoulder where they belong. You might also find that the sleeve is a little bit large, so take that in under the arm too. And perhaps the underarm seam as well. And already just with pinning, the dress will feel more comfortable. Now, there's really not much work to alterations, if you sew, that is. It's just a matter of marking where the pins were, and then take them out. Just a bit of ripping, and then re-sewing the seams. The finished garment should fit and feel comfortable and right for you, and you'll get to show off that newfound figure. As far as men's clothes are concerned, the most typical alteration is in the pants, where the seat's too big. Of course, men's clothing stores are usually happy to fit this out when you're buying a new pair, but suppose you want to refit an old pair. Well, of course, you can do it yourself. And generally, it's just a matter of taking up that center back seam. And the bagginess will be gone just as soon as you re-sew it. Now, what about choosing new clothes for that newfound figure? Well, once you get past 40, fashion doesn't count nearly as much as comfort does. You find something that feels good, and you're almost willing to wear it forever. I don't buy very much clothing. I don't need them very much. I mean, almost the time, I have a respectable suit for when I want to go any place, you know, or church or someplace, you know. But I usually have them run around like this. Yes, it seems like the older we get, the wiser we are about the comfort and convenience of our clothes. And in order to be comfortable, things need to fit right. Of course, having that fitting done before you leave the store is probably wisest. But there are some types of clothes that are just plain more comfortable. The raglan sleeve, for instance. It seems to give freer arm movement, so this is something you might watch for when you shop. And it's pretty hard to beat a sweater for comfort, too, regardless of the style. But if you want a sweater that's warm, yet still light in weight, watch for one of acrylic fibers. You can catch this on the label. Acrylics are comfortable to wear and easy to care for besides, because they're machine washable. Then there are those pesky back zippers. Women have long gone through contortions with these. Why bother when there are ever so many garments on the market with stylish, easy-to-reach openings? 
Bigger buttons, too, are easier for less nimble fingers to operate. And another note for women, seamless waistlines. These offer more comfort in clothes. You can even go beltless this way. As we get older, we also need to get wiser about clothing safety. Of course, carelessness can go with any age, but then perhaps that's a good reason to watch for buys in clothing where fabric will not flash into flames at the least little spark. And we can also watch for dictates of fashion that get us into trouble, such as tripping pants cuffs or catching sleeves or the tangling robes, slippery slippers, and shoes such as these that are just plain designed to spell disaster for the wearer. Yes, as we get older, falls are one of the prime reasons why we end up in the hospital. And that's another reason to keep in as good physical shape as possible. The better the muscle tone, the more likely you are to be able to stay on your feet when you're thrown off balance this way. Now, what about fashion after 40? Your interest in clothing change as you grow older, Never. I'll always like a red dress. Oh, that's not true. That's not true. A peacock stays a peacock even when it starts to molt. Yes, people are interested in clothes at most any age. And they want those things that really make them look and feel their very best. They watch for the designs as they buy. Will it do anything for me? Will it make me look slimmer or fatter? Curved lines, what will they do? Well, most fashion experts say they tend to add the look of pounds, while vertical lines give a slimmer look. And this is true of men's clothing as well as women's. Now, what about horizontal lines? Well, judge for yourself. Note that the further apart they are, the more likely they are to make you look wider. But closer together, they too can give a slimmer look. Now, what about color for the older adult? Well, now is the time to really make use of color when you're in the second half of your life. Your own coloring starts to change, so this is not the time to look for drab grays and blacks. Color livens up your appearance. And yes, it's the thing that puts the dash into your past 40 haberdashery. Yes, the second half of your life can give you many colorful years yet. In some cases, just as many as you've already enjoyed. But to keep these as fruitful, active, productive years, you need to keep them, as I said, active years. You're at the peak of your career. It's the time when you're financially more stable. Uh, you have occasionally a little more time. Your kids are, are starting to be um, pretty independent. So you have time and money to do things. But if you don't have the health and you don't have the vitality and the fitness that, that may help you with that vitality, then it's very difficult for you to really enjoy those years. I think that the, the real key is that you really have to have a positive attitude. The other thing that you're going to find in an exercise program, you're going to find that during your work day and in the evening that you're not going to be as tired. You're going to build up your endurance and you're going to be able to do many things that you haven't been able to do in uh, many, many years. So let's try it. Let's plan now to get a little more life back into the second half of our lives. <laughs> 